Um, yes. Okay. Welcome everybody to Popular Music Books in Process. Um, this is, as always, a collaboration between the Journal of Popular Music Studies, the Pop Conference, which just put its conference schedule online this week. So if you haven't checked out all the goodies coming your way in September, you should definitely do that. And the organization IASPM US. So everyone's gotten together to do this weekly book series. Um, for today, we are thrilled to be joined by Maria Sherman and Tamar Herman. Um, I'm going to at least once make the joke about the team of Sherman and Herman because it's so fun. <laughs> but after that, I'm going to let it go. Um, okay. So <laughs> um, Maria Sherman is a music writer and culture critic living in Brooklyn. The book she's talking about, Larger Than Life, which is a history of boy bands from NKOTB to BTS. And it was released uh, in July. She's a senior writer at Jezebel, has worked for the broader Gizmodo Media Group, for Fuse TV, for BuzzFeed Music. She's written for NPR and Billboard, for Spin, for Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly. To the extent there's a music press left, she's been in that music press. Awesome. <laughs> so we were really glad to have her here. Um, Tamar Herman, New York City-based journalist specializing in international music and media focused on Asian pop culture and its trends um, to the point where um, when I tracked down an obscure article about <laughs> Korean data fans and their so-called little fresh meat icons, she was quoted. Um, in addition to her role as a pop correspondent at Billboard, um, she's written for outlets including NBC News, Forbes, and Entertainment Weekly. She also appears in the K-pop episode of Vox's Explained docu-series on Netflix, which I didn't know about and now I will check out, um, manages, <laughs> managing edits the K-pop blog cult scene, and also co-host the Nice Jewish Fangirls podcast. And her book, which I don't have to hold up. Can you hold up your book? Is your book handy? BTS. It blood, is, but there's post-it notes. Tears. What? They're yeah, very well centered. <laughs> and there's post-it notes. That one came out like maybe just like last week or something. Um, two weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. So congrats. August, congrats. August 11th. Awesome. Um, congrats to both of you. We're really looking forward to the conversation today. My only final notes are next week in the series, we sort of, um, go all the way back in boy band terms because we have Ashley Khan talking about a book he's put together of George Harrison on George Harrison. Um, so going, going back to that version of the boy bands. Um, and he'll be joined by Holly George Warren, Mark Rowland, Anthony DeCurtis as well in a little George Harrison love fest. Um, final point for today before we get going. Um, if you haven't already, click on chat. That spot is your spot to send questions that our moderator for the Q&A part, Carl Wilson, will field and pass on to our guests in about 45, 50 minutes, but we're mellow. We'll see how the conversation goes. All right, I think that is enough preamble. Please take it away. Yeah, thank you everybody. Hey, I'm Maria Sherman. Uh, I wanna thank Eric and Kim and Carl and Pop Conference and everyone who's presented in this incredible series. Normally I'm working right now, so it's kind of nice to, <laughs> to get off the Jezebel blog grind for a minute and get to talk about my favorite subject matter, boy bands, and to have Tamar here as well. Um, this is gonna be a really fascinating conversation. We're gonna get as contemporary as you can get in the boy band story with focusing on the biggest band on the planet. And uh, I'll probably have more questions for Tamar than I will have <laughs> insight to share with you all. Um, so uh, to give a little bit more background on my book, and then I'll let Tamar do the same for those who are curious and don't have it yet, and you should absolutely have it. It is the definitive boy band, or BTS work, excuse me, it should be the boy band, I did that one, uh, BTS work, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, my book, uh, I, the subtitle says it's, a, it's from New Kids on the Block to BTS, but the book kind of begins in the 1800s. I've presented uh, too many pop cons to not kind of venture into secular male vocal group tradition and, and sort of investigate how that leads to the one directions of the world that I hold so near and dear and also why I'm wearing my Backstreet Boys shirt here uh, today. Um, it's not as academic as a lot of the texts that have been explored in the subject, though it is kind of chock full of critical analysis delivered with a sort of tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic, 
borderline fan language. I think they're like the enthusiasm kind of bleeds out of the text and, and I decided to write the book in that fashion and to make sure that it both had the sort of intellectual curiosity that other music that maybe is more, is validated critically um, as, as like other subjects and also was still fun because boy bands are fun and books should be fun even if we're talking about gender, sexuality, race, labor, exploitation. A lot of topics I'll try to get through today, um, but don't be too heavy handed. So we'll just, we'll do what we can. Um, and with that, I would love it if, if Tamara wanted to uh, take over and talk a little bit more um, about her BTS work and, and maybe the book specifically. Uh, hi everybody and thank you everybody who Maria mentioned and Maria herself for inviting me to this. This is my first PopCon and I'm very excited. Uh, like Maria said, my book is also very similar to hers. Uh, BTS Blood, Sweat, Tears is not supposed to be particularly academic. The point of it is to be kind of the definitive first book that people can kind of go to if they want to really jump into BTS and find out who this South Korean boy band is beyond, you know, just Wikipedia or what you can find on um, like Twitter or whatever. So there's a whole lot of articles, but I've been covering BTS um, since pretty much day one of their career and for Billboard since 2016. So um, just as they were taking off and it kind of just felt like there was this space where we kind of weren't having a critical uh, view of BTS. And, and my book is far from like you know, I hope that it's just the first of many. It's far from like being the most critical BTS work ever out there. It's kind of just a celebration and kind of an introductory guide that's very, very long and very in depth. And I wish it was as funny as Maria's book. Maria is hilarious. I was laughing out loud reading hers. Um, but it's just kind of uh, from the American perspective, kind of trying to figure out why BTS connects with so many people, why so many people across the world were, you know, um, this was the K-pop group that it, like made it in the West. So it's kind of just, you know, 300 pages of trying to figure that out in, in my own way. And so uh, it's really exciting to kind of see this book maybe out into the world and get to talk about it and get to talk about all the like the cultural elements behind BTS, all the emotional elements behind BTS, everything that just kind of has led them to get to this point where you know they're at the top of this game, the game, and they're like they're not they're just on so many levels beyond every single boy band that is currently active, and it's just kind of uh, a really fascinating perspective after getting to read Maria's book and then getting to release my book into the world to kind of just think about where they are in the world of boy bandery. Yeah, and it, it certainly does that. And um, I make the point kind of perhaps too frequently in my book where I believe each boy band sort of differs from the one that preceded it, um, either culturally or even like in their musicality. Um, and BTS has done that in a way that I think is very apparent, uh, even if people aren't the music <laughs> like nerds and fans that they are in, in this conversation, they can look at BTS and, and watch their videos and realize there's something very different about what they're doing and like a NSYNC saved the impeccable dancing. Uh, though mm -hmm. I would say BTS is a far superior in that way. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> it's like I can diverge on that for a second. I mean, something about BTS that's so different from all the other boy bands in your book is they're coming from a whole other boy band history. So like BTS is far from being the first huge K-pop boy band. There's literally been like Guinness World Records broken by other B like K-pop groups like TVXQ in the late 2000s. Um, and so uh, K-pop, like that history is from such a different perspective than just the boy bands that we're talking about mm -hmm. from, because like we both are talking pretty much from the Western perspective. It's just like, that's something I always like, like like people to think about because sometimes people are just like oh B B bts is the first k-pop boy band that ever like did that and it's like uh, it's a little it's so much longer there's so many boy bands in the world like i i love boy bands and there are just so many of them out there yeah that's Wonderful. that's a fair point yeah maybe we'll re continue to reiterate that we're writing this from an american perspective i've already had like canadians reach out to me or like why didn't you include this band i've never heard of in my book. And I'm, like, oh, yeah, I'm not from canada uh but you know maybe in the next one um I, like, yeah, um, I want to kind of go back a little bit and establish some sort of foundational boy band ideas, maybe like definitions, characteristics, tropes that we can interrogate and destroy <laughs> together in conversation. <laughs> um, in writing my book, it was really sort of challenging to find where to begin. Um, and luckily enough, I, the first book that I sort of read in preparation for this was Nelson George's uh, Where Did Our Love Go? The Motown book and his intro very explicitly argues that there are no definitive histories, biases are inherent, and also 
it's kind of impossible to know everything about Barry Gordy and <laughs> Motown story. And I'm like, wow, that feels so true to all of the boy bands that I'm exploring. Um, the sort of impresarios behind the scenes want to keep everything very private. So all you're really seeing is the glitz, the glamour, all, all of the sort of like the joy elements that boy bands are sort of celebrated for. Um, and, and that is also kind of tricky because I immediately thought, oh, maybe I want to interview all of these boy bands. And then of course, nobody responded to any of my inquiries. And, and I found that to be kind of a blessing in disguise because um, I find that most boy band biographies aren't really that in depth. I mean, they certainly skirt around any sort of exploitative behaviors, even like Marys of the last couple of years sort of interrogating Lou Pearlman, the man behind Backstreet Boys and NSYNC seemed to be limited in scope, I would say. Um, and and uh, there's a book on New Kids on the Block a couple years ago that was pretty good, but it also, I felt it didn't give the whole store the like racial history of new kids on the block that feels like a limit description it of course mentioned how they were formed kind of in the image of new edition as this like white new edition and that's why new edition is on the cover of my book because i sort of consider them to be the first of the modern contemporary boy band arc there's a lot of beatles of course and, and motown that's the sort of foundation for a lot of this music but when we think of a boy band now a lot of people will consider the y2k back Boys and sync image, and if that is what the sort of cult consensus is, or like the most familiarity, then we're really talking about what New Edition had laid forth. Um, and then there's like some tricky racial history, of course, in this that gets skirted over. Um, that's why I made it a point in my book when I am talking about New Kids on the Block sort of early on to mention that the reason they were able to be so successful is they had this sort of inherent understanding of, of Black music because of um, Boston's Racial and Balance Act, which meant that they were bused into black neighborhoods for school. They actually ended up going to school in Roxbury where New Edition was from, from and that's how they learned about B-Boy and all this black music that informed New Kids on the Block and that has informed the boy band story forever. Um, kind of um, continuing on, um, I found that in writing this book, there were sort of two histories that worked in concert with one another. Um, and also kind of layered on top of each other in, in the way that boy bands are written about historically. There's the image of the fangirl, the sort of hysterical, gendered, marginalized, underwear, wedding, beetle maniac, um, the, the image of a young woman losing her stuff for a male performer that I had to sort of traverse. And that's an idea I actually explored in my 2016 PopCon paper with the sort of funny image that I decided to include in the book of a Franz Liszt fan um, of the composer in the 1800s. She collects a stump of his cigar and puts it in a locket and wears it around, which is such beautiful fangirl behavior that still exists hundreds of years later. Um, it's very easy to go on eBay and, and see fangirls like trying to bid on hairs that may or may not belong to Harry Styles and, and that sort of idea. Um, and, and obviously that fanaticism I find to be very endearing and, and just sort of like expert level enthusiasm as opposed to this thing to marginalize, which is very sticky territory. And then the second history, of course, is the actual musical history. Um, I think it would be sort of impossible, maybe a little bit too presumptuous to pinpoint one song as being the first sort of quote unquote boy band song, though I do make an attempt and I sort of landed after having conversations with many other music buffs on, um, 1956, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, Why Do Fools Fall in Love? They're teenagers, it's a love song. It's very cute, it's very crush-worthy. Uh, it's at a time when teenagers are beginning to have money to spend and are kind of becoming pop culture creators and the tastemakers, it makes a lot of sense there. And then I kind of go into Beatles, Motown, and, and the rest. Um, I also found it really hard to kind of pinpoint an etymology of boy band, which I thought would be, oh, maybe that'll be where the story starts when we start using the terminology. And of course, nothing is that easy. And I'm sure many people who've written many more books in this conversation <laughs> are very well aware of that. Um, but the one example I did find kind of cited continuously throughout like a lot of articles I read and like teen magazines, I guess that would be the spectrum primarily in documentaries is a quote, um, Lou Pearlman, once again, Backstreet Boys and Sync creator, said in a 1999 interview for a tiny little teen book in 2000, uh, where he said, the term boy band comes from 1980s Germany, and it's supposed to be a play on the idea of boy toy and rock band, sort of softening, infantilizing, maybe making less mature, well, obviously making less mature the sort of boy band, the instrumentalist, um, and then boy toy is 
maybe a conversation for another time. I feel like that's inherently kind of queered, um, but the way that he, he's using it is just to sort of make sexualize, even though we're still talking about teenagers at the time. Um, but what I found to be so interesting about that element is if we're not using boy band until 1980s, when um, American boy bands are starting to break in Germany, that means we're already divorcing it from the black music that kind of created the boy band story. Because in the 1980s, this is when already new kids on the block are sort of on their way to world domination or already dominating, essentially. Um, so it's it's sort of complicated to, to figure out what a boy band is. I really don't land on a working definition and I would love to hear uh, Tamara's thoughts on this because mine essentially are just that uh, it's a group of young men, attractive, sing well together, some of them dance, some of them don't, and they perform for a primarily young female audience. Um, and then of course they're sort of defined by the ways that they're marginalized or degraded. Um, they are seen as kind of invalid or not worthy of musical criticism the way that other pop music has been, even after the sort of optimism debates of the great 2010s or what have you, um, that they're sort of seen as outside of, of the tools that we use to describe and criticize music. I think a lot of it is based on songwriting. I find that in Western pop music history, when we're, when we're talking about something, we're thinking about artistic authenticity as defined by the songwriter. And obviously a pop performer doesn't need to be a songwriter. Um, and then beyond that, there's the whole thing about being created <laughs> and being manufactured, the like factory made idea um, that I guess sometimes is celebrated in the Motown story and in the boy band story is used to criticize them. Though maybe it's not always celebrated. I'm still working on these thoughts, but tomorrow I would love to, I would love to hear you uh, now talk about maybe BTS and, and where do they fit in in the boy band story and those tropes. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of, there's a lot of similarities between how boy bands are perceived in like the Western canon versus how specifically K-pop ones. There's, you know, a whole wide range of idol mu pop music scenes throughout Asia, but specifically focusing on K-pop. Um, it's actually K-pop sort of like it's, you know, the definitive date of K-pop beginning is in 1992 when a group called Soteji and Boys performed a song called I Know on television and it was, you know, New Jack Swing mixed with hip hop and there was B-boy dancing. There was like, it was, it was like an explosion and Korea wasn't ready for it. And it also came similarly at a time when um, young people had money, when Korea had just gone through their demo, uh, like they just got their neck, their current state of democracy. And so, um, but the thing is, is like this trio was considered kind of the first, um, kind of like the, the, pre the prequel to K-pop because they were, they kind of formed themselves. But at the time, So Taeji was like, gained the reputation of being like the pop culture president of South Korea because they were singing about things like, um, inequality and classrooms being you know a place that of like essentially like torturing children because people are so stressed out by school and everything and you know the thrive like the the drive to be at the top of your game and so k-pop historically has kind of uh been really an interesting th phenomena because you have like boy bands in the west you have something like with them not you know they're they're aiming for particularly young audiences predominantly uh, but then early boy bands and then now currently with BTS and a few others at the same time as them which I explore in the book uh, a lot of boy bands actually explore these kind of sociocultural issues so it's very very different from boy bands in the U.S. where like it's just about love that's not to say there's not singing about love but a lot of their biggest hits kind of explore these more you know personal um kind of intimate issues that people are dealing with with like personal growth and you know cultural growth and societal issues and that was like a big structure in early k-pop boy bands so like groups like god and shinwa and hot and even like if anybody's familiar like super junior and tvx you have songs that do that also so then you've got like a whole range of, of boy bands kind of doing something that in the west boy bands don't really do and um i think bts kind of is the, kind of the blend of these two legacies where they are targeting certain audiences and kind of being, you know, the boy band, especially in the West, like the whole, the idea of the audience is, you know, predominantly teenage white girls. And that's what the target audience is. And so BTS has kind of come into the, this, you know, total different pop culture world with their audience, with what they're bringing with them from their Korean, from their Asian background as a boy band, 
built over there and come over here. And, and if you look at their audience, it does follow the flow of other traditional boy bands that Maria, or other Western boy bands, sorry, that Maria is talking about in her book. So you kind of get this really fascinating blend of them bringing their own, you know, sonic history and their cultural history of what a boy band can and should be. And then you blend it in this one. So, you know, if anybody um, listened to their new song, BTS just released a new single on Friday. It's called Dynamite. It's in English. And it's just like, it is so much like my mom was listening to it and she's like, they are just such a boy band. And if you listen to other songs of theirs that were made predominantly for the Korean audiences, that's not who they're targeting. So BTS is kind of um, this like little bubble of an ecosystem of what happens when you get the blending of what necessarily a Korean boy band's target audience is going to be and what a Western boy band's target audience is going to be. And I think it's kind of like the fascinating epicenter of like culture in the age of like globalization and just like the internet. Um, so, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, I would like to diverge a little bit because I am like very interested in, in Dynamite in general because prior to its release, I was like mm -hmm. kind of fascinated that you have this group once again, biggest boy band on the planet, kind of all over the place. If you go to a store and you see that or faces on it, I feel like you could establish that as some sort of ubiquity in, in the United States uh, where there are teens they will follow. Um, but you have their first English language song coming seven years into their career. Granted, their presence in America is smaller than that. I would say like 2017, I believe, is, is sort of like kind of considered when they're doing like Billboard Music Award and they're sort of appearing on TV for the first time. Jimmy Kimmel, I remember, was kind of early on. Um, and I remember that from your book. Um, but, but the idea that like this song to me doesn't seem like the traditional idea of like a crossover hit. Um, mm -hmm. it, it seems more like it's per, like performative fan service or something because they've kind of made it clear that they could be a boy band performing in another language that isn't even Spanish, which is like sort of what I always anticipated would be the sort of next big wave of, of boy bands in the west or in the west again america um <laughs> how do you sort of view that song and in, in like their sort of continued growth in america yeah so bts has released other songs that either were remade into english like mike drop they released an english version with uh designer and remixed by steve aoki and they've released some songs with steve steve aoki that are sung per, uh, entirely in english by the band but this is their first single that's in english and they kind of uh, packaged it. They, the, all the PR was about them talking uh, about how it's like a, a nice um, like kind of reward or like a treat for everyone in the age of corona when everyone's having a really hard time. So a lot of their verbiage and a lot of their phrasing was about how this song can bring you happiness and how it can be energized. So I think, and they kept on mentioning uh, a little less often, but kind of like it slipped in there, how this was their first single. So this is BTS's first single that's not related to an album. They have an album coming out, but it's kind of like this own little entity. And it's not so different that BTS released a song in another language. They have songs in Japanese. They have a lot of albums in Japanese. They've topped charts there. And they've also had like one Chinese song. The Chinese market is a whole mess for K-pop right now. So there's not a whole lot of that, but usually K-pop acts a few years ago were releasing Chinese songs left and right. So this idea of releasing a song in another language that kind of has a sonic element to it that is you know more typical to that audience is not new it's not anything new for k-pop that's how a lot of k-pop stars you know have grown throughout asia have grown and a lot of stars now are aiming for latin america markets you're hearing a lot of like trilingual songs with spanish korean and Jap and, and english uh but bts this is their first one and it's kind of um, it, it does seem like I think it's really great, but I think even they're kind of aware that this is for the fans. This isn't necessarily from BTS's artistic, like, like I don't know, like their intellectual artistry isn't coming out in this song. They've said they're not the ones who wrote the lyrics. This is the demo that they liked and they decided not to change the lyrics. So I think it's kind of the music videos. They've released one video and then they released a B-side music video, but which was essentially just like, them goofing around while they were for, but like performing the other music video and it was super cute but it just felt like a lot of this was fan service and it was fan service for the sake of fan service but the thing about korean boy bands and not just bts is that fan service isn't isn't an issue there's no issue within k-pop really to kind of be coming from a company there's not really any you know um kind of like shame in being a factory made boy band quote unquote um there's no like that's kind of how the whole pop scene is formed um there obviously are indie acts and there's obviously a whole conversation in south korea about why indie artists can't thrive particularly in the state of the industry right now and why these sort of k 
K-pop companies with their structures and their like kind of like you know uh, trainee to artist um, format is so popular and and it is dominant. Uh, but for the boy bands, like there's no there's not really a surprise for BTS saying we're writing our own songs and even for them to say something like a lot of people, I think were surprised when they announced Dynamite like that they didn't write the lyrics that they didn't write any of the song like their only credits on the song I believe is just their vocals. And I think that surprised a lot of people because that totally um, kind of turned on its head that BTS is in control of their artistry, that BTS is control of their story. But the way that they were um, relaying it to people was, we're picking this song because we think that this is the right song for this moment. Even that is them saying, this is the song that we want to tell and include in our story. So I think everything about BTS kind of wraps up into that idea of like, how do we best you know, relay, like in, in the book, I kind of, I, I got really, really like basic. And I was like, their songs are either about love or life because it was just easier. And I just didn't feel like coming up with new terminology. And this was like one of their songs that really just felt like it's for this moment. It's for people who are living in 2020. And it doesn't really matter for BTS if they are kind of seen as, I, I mean, I don't want to say pandery, but it did kind of come off that way. Like it doesn't matter if they're seen as, you know, releasing this specifically for one audience because to them, first of all, their audience is throughout the world and it's not just going to be one, like their Japanese album did well in the US also. Like their fans aren't just listening to music in one language, whether it's Korean or Japanese or English from them. So I think that they were able to release this song and kind of say, you know what, this isn't a typical BTS song and we're just going to enjoy it and it's going to be its own little festivity. And I think I think like there's a lot to be said about like why they felt like they had to release an English song right now. Did they feel like maybe because they couldn't tour this year internationally and they're not going to have their huge tours in the US, they kind of need to, you know, make an impact in another way, which is releasing their first English song, which everyone's hoping is going to chart um, atop the Hot 100 singles chart. So like, is this kind of how do we engage with our audience that is you know, BTS is popular in Korea, but their audience is predominantly in the US. And so how do we engage with our audience at a time when we can't engage? So how do we do that? We release something that we've never done before. So I think this whole thing was kind of an expansion of who they are at a time when they kind of need to expand. BTS is about to, um, South Korean men have to go enlist in the military for, and now it's about a year and a half. It used to be two years. Um, so there's going to be a sort of lag in their career as members go and enlist. Uh, it's unclear how the, if they're all going to enlist at once or if they're going to stagger it and still stay relevant. Um, but BTS is kind of looking towards like one of the members has to start like his enlistment within the next year or so. So this is kind of the year that was supposed to be like BTS's year with the world tour. And now Dynamite, I think, is another way for them to kind of try to do something really great and really impactful for their audience, which is predominantly in the U.S. Um, and it's going to, it just kind of was an interesting experiment gone right. Like, it's just such a fun song. And it's just so boy bandy. Yeah. And I, I love that your mom uses the description of it being so boy bandy, because <laughs> that was sort of my first reaction because I was like I feel butterflies for this song sort of the first way when I like heard One Direction and I think <laughs> if I was going to think more critically of it than just ooh this is fun um it's that it's inc like probably the most wholesome song I've heard from them outside of Boy With Love which I would say is like probably the BTS song that a lot of American listeners are most familiar with I mean there's even the lyric about waking up and drinking a cup of milk it doesn't get more sort of like um like young and sweet and boyish then so <laughs> even, that sort of image even that is like a nod to their audience because the member who said that line jungkook is known for liking milk over like supposedly over booze like he said it a while ago so it became a meme yeah um but so like including that in the song is kind of like like a wink to their fans uh we can't see you in person but we can release a song that's just for you and maybe other people are going to like it and i think like for them to tap into the very Western boy band sound at this point. Like there's no really other way to describe it. It's a euphoric bubbly disco pop song. And mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussions about the racial roots of disco going on and how that kind of uh, aligns with BTS's roots in hip hop and how BTS always kind of uh, is good at recognizing how a lot of their music is inspired by black culture. They, um, but so I think like this song kind of was just like how do we stay active? How do we keep doing what we're doing? And how do we let our fans know that this is for them? And which is like such a boy bandy thing. And at the same time, it's also like, 
you know, all the, yeah, I could talk about dynamite for hours. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I feel like <laughs> I, I derailed what was our loose structure and I'm very thrilled to have done that. Um, so originally I was going to read a little bit of an excerpt from my book on the topic of masculinity and how I found that boy band sort of offer an alternative to pre-existing images of what a traditional heartthrob or sex god, I'm trying to think of a phrase like that that doesn't feel immediately cringeworthy. Um, and you know what, maybe, maybe actually I will do that and then we can return to how that relates to K-pop and also offering like a, like a different expression of pop masculinity and heartthrob -er in, in the boy band story. Um, sure. So, and also I just kind of want to give everybody a little bit of a taste of how this book is written because I feel like I didn't do myself justice and, um, and it'll be quick and brief. So this is from a section called Boy Band Masculinity on the Margins, Androgyny and a New Kind of Sex Symbol. Here's a short list of various goods and services Cosmopolitan has rated things men think are manly. Beards, big dogs, cars, guns, stakes, fighting, football, lumberjacking, explosions, leather jackets, whiskey, cigars, man caves, and not asking for directions. All of those objects are shit brown in color and none of those concepts will come up in a word association game where the prompt is boy band. Cars might come close, but BTS's school bus in the No More Dream music video or the sexy turquoise convertible in new editions, if it isn't love, would be more accurate. This is a long-winded way of saying, of introducing the dangerous concept of manliness as a social construct. All the aforementioned antiquated notions of brute strength, dude stuff gets thrown out the window when discussing boy bands, and everyone is better for it. As the record has established, boy bands exist on the margins of pop culture and its coverage. Unsurprisingly, their dominant fandom reflects those margins. I'm speaking of the minority groups who love and adore them, young women and gay men, and other populations who rarely get their fair share, a nasty effect of boy bands being big business, and big business thriving on binaries where whole demographics are depressed into marketable bars on a graph. However, boy bands' expressions of masculinity too exist on the dynamic margins, which makes their manhood fertile ground for investigation, the same way critics have long interrogated David Bowie's queer aesthetics or 80s goth bands that generously layer mascara. Uh, that one's for the Robert Smith fans who might be in, <laughs> on the Zoom call, or Jaden Smith and Young Thug's fashionable hip hop androgyny. It's no wonder that in recent years, boy bands have become the focus of some ethnomuseological study as purveyors of a new kind of gender neutrality soft, chase, and borderline fluid. In the article, Marketing Androgyny, The Evolution of Backstreet Boys, scholar Daryl Jameson describes a trend in popular culture as a move away from idealizing mature, strong men in favor of young, androgynous boys. Think Nick Carter as the ultimate dreamboat instead of Humphrey Bogart or like The Rock. I don't know why The Rock was my example of the ultimate dreamboat, <laughs> but you know, probably is. Um, he writes, the reasons for this general re generational reversal in taste among straight females females are no doubt many varied and comp and one of these principal vehicles for the shift is uh, the cultural shift is a manufactured band. This trend, he claims has developed a relatively new type of male sex symbol, sensitive, soft skin, typically blonde, thin if not emaciated, youthful, which implies a lack of body hair, boundless energy, as well as coy and naivete, fashionable and possesses an above average ability to dance. He isn't a word androgynous. Um, and then I kind of go on and, and give examples of how that sort of challenges traditional images of like the rock god, the band in the boy band definition, um, and how boy bands themselves can also sort of exist in this weird gray area where they're, um, I guess, like objectified more than other pop stars would be, or they are in a way um, that feels separate from the way that like rock gods are. It, it seems like they, um, let me, let me add one more paragraph to this. <laughs> There's a whole <laughs> book to be written about the politics of positioning these boys outside of the male gaze, the feminist theory that women in art and history are portrayed by men as submissive sexual objects. Um, and then I saw so I, this book by uh, Georgina Gregory on pop uh, boy band mus uh, masculinity, which is really fantastic and everybody should read if they're interested on boy band masculinity specifically. Um, she points out that performing on a stage, boy bands are looked at and objectified similar to how women are in everyday life. 
Of course, those men are also compensated in the process, whereas women live in danger of abuse, fear of harm, and perennial subjugation by the men whose hungry eyes feast upon them. Boy bands don't walk alone at light with keys between their fingers like makeshift wolverines to protect themselves from evil. Um, nevertheless, boy bands uh, subvert harmful traditional images of what a man is supposed to be and offer an inviting alternative. And I think maybe in a very sort of quick hit way, it's that idea of offering an alternative masculinity to especially young women um, that makes boy bands resonate in the way that they do and also makes it maybe threatening to traditional images of hetero masculinity to, to patriarchy. Just maybe, maybe one of the ways that boy bands are derided within this sort of capitalist structure that we exist in. Um, and I, I, like, I was gonna say I should write a book about that, but there's already a fantastic one. But in, in writing that section, it made me think the way that I'm describing it and the way that the research kind of exists is specific to a sort of white masculinity um, and, and like the way that um, young white men are, are sort of sexualized even when they're performing songs that are pretty chaste, very virginal, um, all of those things. I'm wondering how do you see BTS kind of challenge existing structures of, of masculinity or, or what, what's their sort of role in that uh, in that conversation because I think even we've we've mentioned this sort of just between you and I before but like even the image of the um, East Asian man as a heartthrob like I think is a very new idea in, in America in pop culture. Uh, yeah so I mean BTS and just um, Korean pop stars in general kind of are formed in a different environment where there's no you know um, like reductive viewpoint about what a boy band is like because they're just you know the main mainstream men so east asian men kind of being seen with this orientalist effeminate viewpoint in western media like bts kind of coming to break into it they're kind of an interesting example because bts aren't necessarily you know the most uh, like stereotypically pretty k-pop boy band out there they're not necessarily the most like beloved you know hem seen as handsome pop stars in south korea so they're coming in kind of in a like you know the more average everybody Korean guy to a lot of audiences who are watching them so like um, but if you look in their music video for Dynamite they and actually another boy band Super M who's also kind of targeting the U.S. audience both of them I noticed in the past week alone they kind of toned down their eyeliner and mascara which was just very interesting to me because you know they're just trying to kind of lean into this um, very Western idea that men shouldn't wear makeup whereas in Korea like some of my friends have told me like if a guy showed up on a date without wearing like foundation like she would be annoyed because like why didn't he put any, like any like like any time into their date and like uh, just you know um in korea like male grooming it's the biggest for male grooming um, in the world the chinese government has actually had like meetings in congress about how korean pop stars are a threat to the masculinity of chinese men because they're so popular and they've banned chinese uh, sorry they banned korean television dramas from china because of this so korean um, pop stars and just star, male stars in general are existing in this total other environment and I think for many western audiences seeing BTS this has kind of been not only um can I freeze uh -oh. I can hear you okay sorry I froze oh, okay um so uh BTS is kind of existing as not only um, a group that's just like counter to toxic masculinity and you know I speak to fans all the time who say things like um, I just recently spoke to a trans uh, gender male fan and he said that he kind of had shied away from you know things like jewelry and earrings because that made him feel like people would think oh you're not you know you're not like be transphobic and like oh you're not you're not manly enough uh, but seeing BTS he said he gained empowerment because they're coming from a total different cultural background about what it means to be masculine you know what it means to be a man in this day and age and what it means to be you know a, a popular man and so there's like none of that same aggressive you know you know uh, seeing a k-pop star with a gun like BTS's whole their name actually translates to bulletproof boy scouts so like they're almost antithetical to guns in a way. Um, they do have a lot of gun choreography, which I would love to write a paper on, or at least not a whole book, but um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. But I think just they're kind of offering an alternative, not only to toxic masculinity, but like to Western centric perceptions of what a man can and should be in public spaces. So I think, you know, BTS hasn't, aside from like the eyeliner stuff, like they haven't, you know, necessarily bulked up to meet Western audiences. They haven't necessarily tried to like, uh, 
you know, uh, make themselves like fit into this idea of what a male heartthrob should look like because they're kind of just doing their own thing. So there is definitely some, you know, acknowledgement that the industries are different and some K-pop stars, like there's one fav famous um, idea that one company, SM Entertainment has like a guide book with different eyeshadow colors that you're supposed to wear put on your stars in different countries um but that's kind of more about localization than the idea of like men shouldn't act this way or women shouldn't act this way so bts hasn't necessarily tried to change themselves in any way and i think that for fans it's kind of not only just you know an alternative it's it's honestly just you know a whole other like world view of how men can and should be in pop culture spaces. And I think boy bands in general kind of have to fit this, you know, they have to, um, you know, in, like endear themselves to their audiences and BTS and K-pop bands do that a thousand percent. <laughs> but the, the idea of like endearing themselves in a way that is n not masculine enough like intentionally, that's not necessarily the point of boy bands in K-pop. In like sometimes there have been like these quote unquote beastly idols. Um, so that's usually like like more built idols who like stars who work out more. And like, that's the whole concept of some groups. And, and it's just like, this is just another thing. But at the same, at the end of the day, they're still, you know, going to be charming. They're still going to try to attract a similar audience. They're still trying to, you know, there's not the same sort of, I want to say there's no stigma to being a boy band in South Korea, but there is definitely like that, that toxic element of it is a little bit lessened, but things like I mentioned the military before and some stars who don't go and serve if they go and do like a lesser service or they get out of it, that will be seen as something that's like not masculine enough. Like that's kind of where the masculinity, the toxic masculinity of like not serving in the army comes into play. But until that point, most stars in Korea are kind of, most male stars in Korea are kind of like, you don't have the same perceptions that we do here that like, oh, you're not, you know, you're not sexy enough. Like you're not masculine enough. You're too boyish. Um, and it's just kind of like, there's something for everyone and K-pop is going to give that to you. Yeah, I was trying to think of what would the Western equivalent be of like th this idea of like the beastly boy band, and I'm like, like <laughs> LFO, like 98 degrees. I, I don't know. Like, uh, though they yeah, like, maybe 98 degrees. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't have the hits, but they certainly <laughs> and uh, Nirvana. And like Nirvana, <laughs> not at all. The reason I have a section on Blink 182 in my book is entirely because Anne was like, you have to talk about pop punk as boy band, and I'm like, okay, I'll I'll, I'll do a little tease, and then that, that's the next book or something. Um. Oh man, I, I feel like we've only skimmed the surface of some of the things I wanted to cover. Um, but maybe let's, I, I feel like we haven't talked totally directly about a conversation of race and maybe this is a way that we can conclude a little bit and, and open it up to some questions. Um, one thing I really struggled with in, in writing this book was just interrogating the idea of who gets to be a boy band. Because as I've already established, boy band music, like all popular music is black music. And yet a lot of the the black male vocal groups, I'm, I'm using that term because they're not sort of historically written as boy bands, aren't considered boy bands. And I think a lot of that is because when um, a group of, of black men or Hispanic men, unless they're like Menudo playing songs that are inherently childish, if, if they were to perform like R&B pop songs, it's sort of immediately read as sexual, like the PG-13 to boy bands, eternal PG until record four or whatever, when they're allowed to be a little less coded in their carnality or or what have you um and and the example i always turn to is, is something like boys to men who i consider to be a boy band but i also consider them to be like too cool to be a boy band and also i think they were just sort of always written out <laughs> of that history um because they were black though backstreet boys since day one were always like we yeah we want to be boys to men <laughs> in the same way new kids on the block were like we want to be new edition um, and it's interesting to consider, all, especially that music of the, like, I keep saying Y2K, I simply mean the 2000s, that music um, being so separate from the source material. Um, Cause I never once considered like uh, a Backstreet Boys ballad to be an R&B song when in fact, it was essentially just a, a boys to men song performed by, by white boys. Um, and, and I guess there wasn't a lot of interrogation of that music. And that might just be because people weren't writing critic as critically about that sort of boy band music at the time. Um, and, and still didn't, um, for, for many, many years until now when we wrote our books. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering, uh, 
maybe even how like black music plays into the K-pop story and BTS's story. And then also, um, I guess the idea of like the Korean boy band in America, that feels too broad, but just it's, it's really kind of exciting to see um, not a non-white group have this sort of resonance. I mean, the closest we'll get is like um, the sort of white passing boy band member, like Howie from Backstreet Boys with Puerto Rican, and then like Zane uh, from One Direction, um, obviously not as white passing, but that was kind of the extent of seeing any sort of racial diversity in the like the mainstream you can buy their stuff in the dollar section of a Target, like boy band phenomenon. Um, so yeah, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, cultural appropriation is a huge issue within K-pop. Um, there's, you know, uh, pretty much, it, it feels, especially this year, like every day, a K-pop group is getting called out for appropriating either black culture or, or recently um, a group like Blackpink was called out for um, misusing uh, an idol, a Hindu idol, like, uh, a K-pop group recently had to apologize for wearing cornrows. Uh, BTS hasn't, you know, not done that in their very early um, music videos and songs. Like it was just blatant, you know, they were just ripping off of what like they perceived as like cool black American culture and they have hip hop roots in their music. And a lot of the members have roots in the indie hip hop, in the underground hip hop community in South Korea. So like there was a lot of overlap and they ended up actually coming to the US and um, like learning with like Coolio and um, um, this TV show about how, like the roots of American hip hop and and you know they've recently donated like a million dollars to Black Lives Matters um, and so like they've kind of spent a lot of their career kind of dealing with this and that is kind of only just now really taking place in the larger South Korean industry. Black Lives Matters I think um, got some very prominent artists um, like, I don't know if people are familiar with CL from 21 and the R&B singer Crush essentially calling out the industry for not recognizing Black artists' contributions, Black culture's contributions, and saying, like, we need to change this. So the change is probably going to come slowly um, just because uh, Korea has a lot of issues with racism in general, let alone in the pop industry scene. But I think, like, we are seeing some change, but there is still a lot of reluctance to kind of the acknowledgement. Um, sometimes you'll see a lot of um, like criticism. Well, America forced their, you know, culture on us. So how is it appropriation of us, you know, absorbing this element of American larger culture, which is like such a great conversation we have and is way beyond the scope of this or like my life. Um, but it's just, you know, there's so much going on here about how Korean pop music, has, South Korea's pop industry has kind of absorbed elements of American colonial popdom. And BTS, like, I don't, I'm not saying that they're like the be all and end all of that, but BTS kind of exists in this space where they've had to um, deal with it publicly. Like, so at a certain point, you saw them after, you know, they kind of learned about the roots of hip hop and stuff. They did gradually pull it away from like their main singles and everything. But then every once in a while they go full blown hip hop, you know, the members, two of the members, uh, three of the members, sorry, all the rappers in the group RM, J-Hope and Suga have released mixtapes that really kind of, you know, delve deep into different um, hip hop genre, like sub genres and each member kind of exemplifies what they relate to the most. And it's just a really interesting exploration. And, you know, they work with a lot of American artists. Um, and sometimes there's definitely issues like cornrows keep on popping up. Um, BTS and a lot of other K-pop groups, like they just don't get why black people's hair isn't something that maybe you as not a black person should be emulating. And so it's just this whole big larger conversation um, about you know cultural appropriation versus appreciation. And I think um, on the counterpart, this is like a really interesting thing. Sorry, I know I'm rambling a lot, um, but for a lot of American fans of BTS, you have a lot of Western fans of BTS, you have this total reluctance of being considered a K-pop group because it's kind of a similar conversation to a lot of um, Black artists who are considered R&B, how they don't want to be peg-legged into just R&B, like you should be considered pop or you should be like considered hip-hop or whatever, like why do we have genres? And so a lot of um, Western fans who don't like that BTS is kind of considered like just the be all and end all of K-pop, not just popdom, um, which for whatever reasons they feel that way, they feel like that to be calling BTS as K-pop is xenophobic. And so you have this whole conversation happening among predominantly not Korean audiences trying to dictate that K-pop artists aren't you know, Korean pop artists. So there's uh, like a huge, like this is way beyond the scope of this conversation, but I just kind of wanted to um, add that in that this is this huge conversation going on about like 
what is a pop star when your pop star is not coming from your own cultural background? Yeah, I, I think it's also fast. Like I, I kind of, and maybe this has been something that a lot of people have been considering after um, all of the news uh, following George Floyd's death, where BTS fans were very active in shutting down white supremacist hashtags. And I know you've talked about it to a million different publications and as yeah. am I, but um, I, I was thinking about it in, in the sort of hi the political history of, of what it is to be a boy band fan and how it seems like there is more of a shift, to uh, a shift rather towards sort of political activity within fans themselves sort of divorced from their fandom, but using their fandom as like a platform or a means to engage with whatever their political ideology is. Um, the only sort of like Western example I can think of is, is sort of even just in the later years of One Direction and then like Harry Styles' solo career, fans like making it a point to like throw trans flags and, and rainbow um, uh, and various LGBTQ flags on stage so he would run around with it and that would be enough of a symbol that his value systems aligned with their own. And now I'm thinking it's so fascinating to watch like BTS ARMY and, and other K-pop fans um, kind of signify or like signal that like that's not enough for them and they want to make sure that like their idols are also representing some of their own interests. Granted, uh, with the caveat that that's not like a shared opinion across any fandom and I always get kind of frustrated when people are like and all the fans did this because no, no group of anybody works that way mm -hmm. um but it is interesting to sort of and see then that. and then with like k-pop no can you can go <laughs> oh sorry I was just gonna say then with k-pop fans who are doing that who aren't Asian you kind of get the well are they imposing like colonial values orientalist values on these stars who they think should be sharing their own values that are reflecting them as a fandom and you have this whole big discussion about what Korean artists should be you know, assuming onto them as pop stars when their audience isn't necessarily just the Korean audience. And that's like, actually what I spend all my day writing about. <laughs> and what I spent uh, like and what I spend all my day asking you questions <laughs> about because it's so fascinating. Um, is it time for questions or should we keep chatting? I don't know who to ask um, now. Yeah, now, time. now might be a good-ish time for questions if you're ready. Um, we've, uh, there's been a very lively chat conversation in some cases. It's hard to separate at which are just comments and which are questions. Um, so if anybody wants <laughs> to demure when I call on them, that's fine too. Uh, but the first one we had was from Rob Drew um, asking about sort of starting points. And Rob, if you want, do you want to bring that up? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was about 10 in 1971, and I guess being a budding metrosexual uh, me and my friends were into Tiger Beat and 16 and things like that. And the big groups were Partridge Family and Bobby Sherman. But the biggest were um, uh, the Jackson 5 and the Osmond Brothers. And for me, when uh, new kids and new edition and groups like that started coming up along, it just reiterated. It just seemed to, in a lot of ways, repeat what I had experienced especially in the sense of having a kind of preteen fandom and also the stars of those two groups, the J5 and uh, Osmonds being preteen themselves. And I wonder if either of you would want to make sense of that, that these are kids who are at the centers, at least of those 70s fandoms. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's I, I definitely cover some of that in the book, though not as detailed as uh, I, pr I perhaps should have. Um, it's interesting because there is a history of like the boy band as actually being the age of the group themselves, though I wonder, like the, the shift is interesting and I wonder if it like the sort of conspiracy theorist in my mind is when, when you get to like the 2000s or, or the, the even the 90s, um, the shift is because they need to be adults so they can sign these contracts or what have you. But I, I think the, the history of the preteen frontman kind of exists throughout. Um, like I said, like Fra Frankie Lyman was 13 when Whitey Fools Fall in Love happened in 1956. Nick Carter being the sort of cute one of the Backstreet Boys was also 13. Um, it's only, I feel like it's a sort of 2002 onward tradition where, the, where they start to get a little bit older. Um, kind of staying in the in the teens to early 20s when they sort of uh, quit because they're far too old and at that point you're a man. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question or comment at all, but I, I certainly <laughs> think that there's an element of that and um, 
the, the sort of the youngest player as either a front person or one of the predominant forces in a boy band is also a through line because American audiences have always seemed to be endeared to the sort of cutest, the most wholesome of a group, which is kind of, um, it's, it's to go back to BTS a little bit, I find that interesting that their first English language song is so heavily um, focused on the youngest member as well. That's always been sort of American fascination within the boy band group where they're already pretty young, um, with the exception of like, Kevin Rich, some of the Backstreet Boys and Sync guys who were probably <laughs> too old to be like on the walls of, of tween girls. Um, yeah. Um, okay, and next we have a question from Anne. And well, actually, we have like three or four questions from Anne. So she can decide what, <laughs> uh, what she wants to make uh, her top question. And then maybe we'll come back to her if we have time uh, in the cycle. Thank you so much for such a great uh, talk. Wow, my brain is just going all over the place. So I really so appreciate it. And I'm going to go with a later question than my first question, which is um, I'm interested in what you both think about uh, the relationship between boy bands and technology, uh, particularly uh, 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 video games, gaming. Uh, I started thinking about this uh, tomorrow when you were talking about the difference between the beastly boys, the more built boys, and the and the andro androgynous boys of the boy bands, and thinking about how these young audiences are often engaged in gaming as well, where the uh, the imagery of the male body tends to be more buff, you know, and more like warrior-like often. Although not in all games, certainly we have The Sims, Minecraft. I don't know what you are. You're like a tree or something or a block, but um, but I just wondered about that, because like when you think about boy bands in the 60s, it's so um, connected, to, like I'm talking about the monkeys and then into the Partridge Family stuff in the 70s, it's so tied with television, right? It's like television is your companion, and these, these boys are, are coming to, and even in the 50s, with Ozzy and Harriet and Ricky Nelson, you have that that connection between television and boy bands. So I wondered if, and I'm, I don't know anything about gaming in Korea. like. <laughs> I mean, so that's my question. Uh, yeah, so uh, South Korea, actually, their biggest pop cultural export is gaming. South Korea is one of the biggest game producers of the world, so it's a perfect question. Um, K-pop in general, pretty much every single K-pop star is a gamer. Regularly, K-pop stars are, like, involved in gaming competitions with each other. It's very memeable when they kill each other. It's very fun for a lot of the fans. Um, the The idea of, like, men or just pop stars being reflected in games isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one, like connection but a lot of k-pop stars do end up either representing games as ads bts is about to release their second video game so bts has one called bts world which came out last last year and then they have another one coming out soon that explores so there's a lot a lot a lot to be said about transmedia storytelling and k-pop and bts is kind of like the kings at it and and so they've crew out their music, music videos and their social media. They've created this dynamic BU or the Bangtan universe. So it's this BTS um, storyline that takes the members and fictionalizes them and dramatizes what like each of them are going through and their hardships and their, you know, their personal growth. And they relay it through these music videos and now there's books and now there's a uh, television show in Korea is going to be based off of this fictional story that BTS has shown throughout their music videos and these books and everything else throughout this time. So it's kind of like, um, I always compare it to kind of like Lost or the Marvel Universe, how there is not just, you know, the TV show or the movie. You have all these different elements where you have the video games, where you have um, social media, where you have, you know, television shows and movies and everything. So if you consider, um, I actually was going to read this part of uh, my book. It's an excerpt that pretty much um, alleged or I guess um, considers that K-pop the product isn't necessarily the music the product is the stars and what they can sell and so K-pop stars it's like they're the video game entity almost and the platform is everything that like of everything else that they're doing so K-pop stars are really tied into video games there's actually going to be there is a ready League of Legends has a K-pop girl group that features two K-pop stars and then two American stars KDA and they're about to release their first album so the connection between video games and K-pop is really strong it's not necessarily that ideals of like what men or you know anybody looks like in a video game is reflected in k-pop but it's kind of like um 
the way that technology interplays with K-pop is probably the most important thing to talk about when you're talking about K-pop dumb nowadays, more than pretty much anything else. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question we have is from someone who um, had to leave before the Q&A, but uh, asked me to pass it along. Um, this is from, uh, pardon my pronunciation if I, if I get this wrong, um, Mason Haydar. And they ask, um, I'm interested to know how the personality, quote, casting portion of boy bands factors in, both in terms of them as a group and the inevitable drama when the strongest voice or charisma leads for a solo career. Say in the space of this case of the Spice Girls, they literally named them their persona, but boy bands, it's always been more covert. So I think that's for both of you, just about how that that part functions in in both in the history and present of, of boy bands. Yeah, um, and that is a topic that I totally ignored in my notes. Um, and in boy bands, I think there are very definitive tropes that are kind of accepted, but they're assigned by the fans or by the people sort of talking about them. They're never explained because you don't want to sort of flatten the personality of a charming boy uh, to, to a few words. Um, but those are, of course, the, the heartthrob, which we mentioned a little bit. The cute one, which is not the heartthrob. It's typically the youngest one. <laughs> He's cuter than he is hot. I, I don't know. Um, there's the older brother type, the more responsible one. Um, what am I missing? Oh God, I wrote the book on this. There's a mysterious shy one um, who is, uh, that's often like a racialized term. That would be like your Zayn Malik from One Direction. Um, and then there's the bad boy. And I think like one very surprising thing, or I guess I've known this for a few years now, but one um, sort of like element that surprised me in originally sort of tackling K-pop and, and through a Western lens, through an American lens of the boy band story is that those tropes don't really exist. Um, okay. Though they do embrace like the term boy band, which is also not a very popular idea in, in Western boy band history. Boy bands don't like being called boy bands. Um, but if you were to Ask BTS, I'm sure that they would embrace it. Uh, sorry, it froze there for a second. Um, yeah, like you say, um, I think this is where I heard you up to saying um, K pop doesn't really have different, they have very different labels than, you know, the ones that fans assign. Um, there's a lot less um, like sexualization on the part of fans. Like you wouldn't necessarily hear um, someone like Jimin be called the heartthrob or, you know, Jungkook. Uh, well, he is called the baby, but he's called the magna and it's a whole other thing. Um, but so in Korea, you have actually definitive terms assigned by companies. It's such a, you know, it's a total opposite than what we think of in the Western boy band canon. Like Maria said, they don't assign these terms. They're kind of like the personalities that are um, relate on them, but for K-pop stars, the personalities are kind of, they're definitely shaped and they're definitely dictated. So, you know, someone like, um, this is a total group that probably nobody knows, but Infinite had a member named L and he hated his like mysterious dark guy personality. And years later, he's now an actor. He's a popular actor. And he talks about it all the time, how he was like, yeah, that wasn't me. He was like a, a ball of joy but like his original persona that the company like had him do is like the dark mysterious guy. He always had a lot of eyeshadow and smoky eyes. But for K-pop groups, usually um, things like that are go unsaid and fans don't even really kind of um, acknowledge them to some degree, but things like being called like the lead vocal or the leader of the group or the Mangne, which is the youngest member of the group. These are actual roles. So you have things that are representative of like their performance role and also like what their role is at their company and within the group. So like the Magne, um, you can either be like, like a really sweet Magne who's really nice to your older members of the group. And then they also um, have one who are like the Magne on top, who is like the most controlling, aggressive member on the group. And it's like a form of entertainment to kind of see how these group dynamics are going to play out. Um, and then you have things like lead rapper, main rapper, and these kind of tell the audiences at the start of their career this is what this member is going to do. So expect like this many lines from the lead vocalist versus the main vocalist. And there is a difference and the difference kind of is nuanced and it's about who will like be the power vocal versus who will lead the song. And it's like this whole thing. Um, but I think it's fascinating because those same sort of like um, 
standardized pegging of personalities doesn't exist in part because K-pop groups tend to have anywhere from like five to like 13 members. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to come up with individual personalities. Instead, you're kind of um, in introduced to the individual stars with all their personalities and they're just, you know, supposed to be very personable. Uh, this next question actually kind of comes naturally out of that question. Uh, Michelle Cho, if you're still here, if you want to ask. Maybe. Hey, sorry. Uh, oh, there we um, go. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I'll go ahead. Um, so thank you so much for this conversation. I'm like, yeah, my mind is also racing in like a hundred different directions. Um, but throughout, I've really been thinking about, I think, an idea that um, was posed really early in the conversation, which is that, you know, the connection between like K-pop and then an American boy band genealogy is a very evident and important one, which is why we're having this whole conversation. But at the same time, they're also very, very different um, industry contexts, fandom cultures, histories, like socio-cultural um, aspects that really shape um, how these groups signify. Um, and so I guess I'm, I was wondering if maybe um, the two of you could say a little bit more about one aspect that I think is a point of commonality, although it kind of manifests in different ways, which is this kind of relationship between like nostalgia, which is so clearly a big, big part of how boy bands function, but then also this idea of like a future word orientation, progress, you know, like the, the question for me started off um, in thinking about what the term idol means and how that, if what relation that has, if any, to the idea of like a boy band member um, in North America, because the idol in um, Asia is a role model. So that kind of answers something that I think Anne mentioned in the chat. Um, it really is this kind of like figure of uh, exemplary youth um, who is going to kind of represent the culture of society and nation in the most positive way possible. And BTS totally have this um, burden, I think. <laughs> they're seen as like, you know, global pop stars, but also they're con like constantly renationalized, especially by, um, you know, by the Korean domestic audience, but also like in a lot of Western media. Um, so yeah, like this dynamic between, you know, like, boy bands always being this really repetitive kind of, uh, or signaling this repetitive figure of like coming of age. And so everybody has gone through that. So it's entirely nostalgic. Um, but then at the same time, there's supposed to be something like very of the moment and like, you know, truly on trend and like, you know, not backwards looking at all. Um, how do those dynamics play out um, in the kind of respective genealogies that you're looking at? Um, yeah. Maria, do you want to take this first? Oh God, yeah, I can try. That was that's a great <laughs> question. And now my mind is going a million different directions, and uh, I need to familiarize myself with with some of more of your writing, uh, Michelle, because that was it was really great. Um, I think in considering, and I'm going to speak maybe from Western boy band <laughs> perspective, and then maybe Tamara can correct me when I fumble um, on, on maybe some K-pop idol ideas. Um, but if you kind of consider the idea of k pop idol as role standing and acceptance that you will become the sort of like role model figure. And with boy bands, I think it's sort of understood, but it's kind of rejected. And which is why you'll have like a, um, boy bands as as like a figure for some sort of like youthful charm and charisma but i don't i don't think that they would enjoy being referred to as any sort of role model figure and, wh and that's why there's always sort of an immediate rejection of boy bands as they start to age um whereas something like bts i think maybe maybe this is like a cultural difference that i'm really flattening here and, and i apologize if i am um but i imagine that it's it's something that is more celebrated and like a point of pride um which is also why they ha they can like endure longer until of course there is this sort of mandatory conscription um 
what do you think, Tamara? I feel, I feel very sticky about everything I just said. <laughs> no, I think it's great. Uh, everybody should read Michelle's work. Michelle is great. Um, but, and she talks about things like this a lot in her work, but I think that the role model, like, image of k-pop idols isn't only or just idols in asia because this is a bit broader than just uh, korea but i think we kind of see that here i often compare k-pop idols to disney stars you know to think of jonas brothers their purity rings how pretty much every single female disney star has like had to go like you know publicly like you know lose it to kind of become a woman in public or you're like hillary duff and that's the only one i can think of who like hasn't um you kind of have to go through these steps of proving that you're not, you know, um, I guess like either goody two shoes or kind of a, um, like almost like a, I don't want to say like a, I was going to say a corporate ploy, but that's not really what it is. It's like a representative for like the ideal, the ideals of what like culture or the culture at the moment, mainstream culture wants you to be. And so like K-pop is kind of interesting because at the same time that a lot of, K-pop groups kind of um, rebel against stereotypes. Um, you know, K uh, BTS has a lot of songs that are kind of like taking apart um, elements of the government. And um, and then you have, you know, other groups like nowadays, like Stray Kids doing similar things. But then at the same time, they're, you know, working with the government. And there's a really hilarious video of like um, a, a member of a boy group, Shiny, who's like, seen with Melania Trump because he was like at an event with her and K-pop fans got excited for him and not her and it's just like K-pop stars going to be part of either political things or being literal um, like ambassadors for uh, like regions in South Korea or it used to be I don't remember I don't know if they do it now because I haven't actually watched any of them on TV in a long time but if you watch like a Korean weekly music show where K-pop stars perform there used to be like jingles that were like make sure to buckle up your seatbelt and don't text and drive. Like there is a moral element to being an entertainer. And this isn't limited just to idols. You know, a, K a South Korean star who's done wrong tends to like get banned from the industry more so women than men, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but K-pop stars are kind of supposed to have this moral fortitude when they do wrong. They're not supposed to necessarily, um, you know, they have to make amends, you know, idols have left the industry for things like uh, drunk driving for, um, you know, um, cursing is sometimes seen as wrong. Like some stars have kind of rebelled against that and be like, why the hell can't I curse on a live stream that like my own fans are watching. Uh, but there is sort of kind of this, I wouldn't say it's a stigma, but this expectation that K-pop stars are supposed to kind of align themselves with moral more, the moral right and so I think it's something that like is super different from like the American industry like even stars who surpass you know boy bandery so groups like like Shinwa or Super Junior who are literally going forward and they're closer to their 40s or in their 40s already but still performing kind of like boy bands they're still expected to kind of you know represent a certain lifestyle you know one member sort of got kicked out because he got married in a way that fans thought wasn't appropriate for that group like really like it's it's a whole different ecosystem of what a boy band is and what an entertainer is and, and should be and I don't know if I'm, I answered Michelle's question we can talk about this forever Michelle but um I think that it's just really a hugely different idea of what a star should and could be when you're talking about k-pop versus Western boy bands. The Disney Idol thing is so, like, that's exactly what the equivalent would be. As soon as you said that, I was yeah. like, that makes sense. Because I would think the, the examples I had, we had a whole little section about cultural storytelling that was going to touch on this a little bit. I would think is like um, Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, decked out in their Levi's, this image of like the, uh, it's supposed to be apolitical, but it reads very conservative to me. Um, the sort of like, like it's a hardworking, like working class sort of denim item that you would wear. And then of course, Jonas Brothers becoming sort of shills for um, George Bush abstinence education and, and wearing their purity rings and um, then really sort of um, throwing them off in a sort of dramatic way like other Disney stars. Um, but it always feels sort of like immediately assigned to them. And I'm sure there's uh, that in, in K-pop as well. Um, 
but then there's always a very dramatic like refusal of, of the sort of idea of being a role model. Um, as opposed to Disney stars now, I think of someone like a Zendaya who's like, yeah, I was a Disney star and now I'm doing cool stuff and everything's fine. Uh, not boy band related, <laughs> but it is interesting to see um, how those behaviors have changed in, in American media as well. Okay, I think we're um, coming close to the end, but I'll just take one more question. Um, Chris Melanthi had more than one question as well, and I'll ask Chris to pick his favorite of them and, and ask. Yeah, I'll take um, my first one and morph it a little bit based on where the conversation has gone. Um, as I said in the question, uh, I am banking, as for what Tamar brought up, that I'm probably going to have to write about BTS's Dynamite a week from now when it almost inevitably debuts at number one in the Hot 100. And I, as the writer of Why's the Song Number One, I'm going to be writing about it. So this is just a shameless attempt for me to start doing my research now. So thank you in advance. Um, what I was asking about was, if I, if I heard you right, BTS are now, they are owned or proprietarily, you know, held less by South Korea than they are by the world. And if I even heard you right, by the United States, like their, their fandom, their Korean fandom has been eclipsed by their international fandom. Forgive me if I misheard you when I, when I heard that. Uh, um, it's, not, it's not that their, sorry, it's not that their Korean fandom is, is like clipped by the Western fandom. It's just that Korean audience in general is so much smaller than like America's audience. So K-pop is, you know, created an environment with around 50 million people. So Korean entertainment in general, the audience is looking internationally. So um, you're not just targeting just Korean audiences. So K-pop had different waves of international growth. So first you had Asian growth and now, then like uh, Middle East and Latin America. And now we're kind of in the American stage. So it's just kind of like their target audiences here at the moment. Thank you. And so I guess my, my follow up to that, if I can morph this question into something I had to write about just two weeks ago, when Harry Styles got his first ever Hot 100 number one. And I sort of did a pocket history of boy bands and how boy band members, and I kind of looped in Justin Bieber into this, have to convince a radio audience, which is contrary to popular belief, not composed entirely of teenagers, it's composed of 20 and 30 somethings, that they are grown up. I'm wondering if BTS had a double whammy against them where they needed to feel like they were not only proprietary to K-pop or, or South Korea, but that the language barrier also was sort of the, the next stage in making them acceptable to an international audience. Was, was that the last mile? I mean, it, it's sort of an obvious question, but it seems to me that with Boy With Love, even when Halsey was on the record, that was not quite enough to get the attention, whereas now Billboard is plastering with headlines that the radio acceptance for Dynamite out of the box is stronger than anything they've ever had before. So I don't know if there's a question in there, but that's my meaning. <laughs> yeah, no, I could definitely talk about this. Um, so yeah, so BTS um, has, radio has kind of become the final frontier for them. You know, they've sold millions of records, they're charred around the world. There's not really much more you could do aside from, you know, winning like a Grammy or something. Um, so, but in the US, at least they're still not getting radio play. And if you go on social media and you just type in pretty much anything BTS radio is, you know, for it is a huge pick among their fans. There is an intense feeling that the American industry has kept BTS off air because it's not in English, because the, it's a boy band that isn't kind of um, a typical boy band from this industry. It's not men singing the way that they think men should be singing. There's like all these theories floating around about why K-pop has been kept off the airwaves. It does seem largely racialized. It does seem like largely, um, like you can, you know, discuss, oh, how some things like Mijente and Despacito get radio play, but why hasn't BTS? And so a lot of people feel that it's because, you know, it leans into this stereotyping that Asian men can't be attractive. Asian men can't be heartthrobs. They can't be pop stars. Uh, so uh, I'm guessing, you know, there were a lot of discussions about how long BTS could put off not releasing an English song. And if they needed to release, you know, a whole English album, another boy band, Monster X, just released um, a, a, an album in all English and it did pretty well. So it's kind of like, how far does BTS have to keep going to be accepted on radio without, you know, a line of an all English. This is kind of like, you know, they've worked with Halsey, they've worked with Nicki Minaj, they've worked with Sia. 
and they still have not got anywhere. And so I think this song is kind of the attempt at that is how do we, you know, land on radio when radio has been more or less reluctant. Like I've heard BTS on the radio, maybe the release week once or twice, but this is the first time where I've ever seen it having such a big response. And you have to think it's unfortunately because the industry was reluctant to play it without the English. They were assuming, you know, those fans aren't going to tune into radio. Those fans aren't our radio listeners. So I guess this song is kind of more accessible and it's more, you know, it does seem like it is pretty targeted specifically for radio. There was a lot of push for radio prior to the release. Gotcha. Thank you. Looking forward and, to your article. <laughs> and with that, um, I guess we have to leave it there. Sorry to some of the people whose questions we didn't quite get to, um, but we got most of the way. And um, I want to thank Tamara Maria very much um, for this session, which definitely feels like we could have gone on all evening. Um, so, and thanks everybody in the chat too. Um, th that transcript will be available to you guys later so you can check it out.